uh, congestion control. So our first speaker today will be uh, Dr. Van Graham, uh, who's a senior researcher at the RISE Research Institute of uh, Sweden. His current research interests include uh, the low latency networking, designing network based on the information-centric paradigm, edge computing, and application of sensor networks. So his uh, presentation topic is a uh, security RPD, a multi-pass scheduler for heterogeneous traffic in ICNs based on zero queuing time push. Let's welcome Ben for a start. Hello, I'm Bengt Algren from RICE Research Institutes of Sweden. This is joint work with Carl Johan Grinemo, Karlstad University, Sweden. I'm going to present our work on multipath scheduling called CQT RTT, a multipath scheduler for heterogeneous traffic in ICNs based on zero queuing time ratio. And this is the outline of the talk. I'm going to uh, talk about uh, the background and our objectives. Then I'm going to discuss um, the relationship between link load and queue, because this is the foundation for the metric that we define, that we call the zero queuing time or CQT ratio metric. So, so this metric is then used to, to design the schedulers, the CQT multipod scheduler and the uh, next step, the CQT RTT uh, scheduler. And then I'm going to uh, wrap up with some conclusions. So some background and objectives. So the ICN paradigm naturally supports multipath communication, uh, but we can decide that for different reasons. We may want higher throughput, lower latency, and or increased reliability. In this work, we focus on the first two, that is higher throughput for bulk clients and low lower latency for transaction-oriented clients. Just to set the scene, what we are uh, working with here uh, in terms of multipath scheduling. So, so we assume that we have forwarding tables already populated with multiple entries. So we need the, obviously a routing protocol that does that for us, but we assume that that uh, is in place already. Um, so we assume then that that protocol creates multiple paths uh, to a single source or uh, paths to multiple sources. From a multi-path scheduling perspective, uh, there is no difference there. Then we also assume a CCN and DN style ICN with one request or interest packet per data packet. Then the task of the multi-path scheduler uh, is to decide where to send a particular interest packet on one or several of the available paths for the prefix. So for bulk traffic, we want to optimize for throughput of uh, for throughput of data. Uh, we therefore need to monitor the utilization or load in the data direction. For transaction traffic, we want to optimize for latency. There, we need to monitor the latency. This is pretty straightforward, uh, but to monitor utilization uh, takes a little bit more uh, effort. And I'm going to talk to that uh, in just a bit. So the illustration here is just the multipath router here in the middle. We have a client to the left that sends interests um, that is forwarded by the router uh, on one or more on the paths here to the right to one or more sources that then returns the data. And I should also say that for uh, the objective for bulk traffic is to make use of the available capacity on all the available paths. Now let's talk about uh, link load and uh, uh, the relationship with queuing. So um, the interest for the load queue relationship grew out from uh, working a little bit and experimenting with the CODL, the control delay queuing uh, discipline. Um, and we came to the conclusion that we wanted a metric that tells us more about uh, the utilization just below 100%. So CODL signals when we are at or above 100%, but we want to know more about the load situation below 100%. 
So we made a simple simulation experiment to illustrate the relationship between the load and queue. And we have a rate-based client with constant request interval. We configured to create 90, 95 or 98% utilization of the bottleneck uh, in the, the uh, result that I will show uh, in this presentation. Uh, so we can see uh, as an example, the resulting utilization here, the one second average the red curve, we can perhaps see that it is close to 95% here. We also created some burst burstiness uh, um, with the purpose to create queuing at the bottleneck. And we can see the burstiness here in the 100 millisecond average in the utilization graph here. So the setup is very simple with the bottleneck link in the middle. We illustrate the two directions separately here. Uh, but what we uh, now monitor uh, when we load the bottleneck link in the data direction is the queue here, the return queue. Uh, and we collect uh, the queuing time, the time each packet spend in this queue. And then we create the uh, uh, an empirical cumul cumulative distribution that we plot here. We have the queue time on the x-axis and we see the cur different curves for 90% load, 95 and 98% load. Now we are not really interested in these uh, distributions at all. Uh, we are only interested in what happens here at zero queuing time. Therefore we um, zoom in a bit here and we can see here that the black curve for 90% utilization, um, approximately 10% of the packets have zero queuing time. And for 95% case, the blue curve, um, uh, about 5% of the packets have zero queuing time. And the green curve, 98% uh, case, about 2% of the packets have zero queuing time. So um, it seems like uh, the ratio of packets with no, that is zero queuing time, roughly corresponds to unused capacity, at least for high load. So for low load, we are very dependent on the distribution of packet inter-arrival types. We are well aware of that, but we are mostly interested in high load, and we believe that uh, the relationship uh, holds sufficiently well for our purposes. The intuition behind this is really that, say that we have 95% utilization, then the link is busy 95% of the time. And if a packet arrives at a random time, 95% uh, probability, then the link will be busy. And with 5% probability, uh, the link will be free. And thus, in 5% of the cases, uh, the packet will have no queuing time at this link and 95% of the cases, the packet will have to be queued and thus get some queuing time. Now, with this relationship in mind, uh, we then define the zero queuing time ratio. So we add a, a flag to all packets so that indicates whether the packet spent any time in a queue. So this is additive for the whole path, not just the incoming link of the certain router. So this, this um, uh, uh, flag is never reset, so, so it is just set. If the packet is queued, the, the flag is set, and then it is kept set. Uh, so that means that uh, we will get the information on whether the packet was queued at any hop uh, on the path uh, until uh, the router that uh, 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 monitors this flag. Then the zero queuing time ratio is computed at each hop for each flow, or more precisely for each ICN forwarding entry. The flag is either zero or one. Therefore, it's a bit difficult to average into a ratio. We tried an exponential weighted moving average with a very small alpha, 0.005, but we ran into some problems due to a strong dependency on the packet rate. So for slow flows, it updated very slowly, and for fast flows, it updated uh, fast. Uh, therefore, we instead implemented an average over a fixed time interval. Uh, we settled for 100 milliseconds in the end with a touch of uh, exponential weighted moving average on top with an alpha of 0.25. Now we have the zero queuing time ratio uh, that tells us uh, what the load is 
uh, or or well uh, let me let me go to to this slide first so now when we have defined the cqt uh, ratio metric we uh, uh, design the CQT multipart scheduler as follows. So the zero queuing time ratio is an estimate of unused capacity as we have concluded. Uh, then we compute the path utilization as one minus the CQT ratio. Uh, based on this, we can then uh, compute the path capacity for each of the available paths as the flow rate. We have to monitor the flow rate also, and we divide by the path utilization. And we kind of get, get a kind of path capacity. And then we also sum up all the path capacities to get the total path capacity available for this flow. And then we have the final step of the scheduler. Uh, we simply distribute the load of the flow proportionally to capacity over the paths. So for each of the parts, we take the path capacity and divide by the sum of the path capacities to get a path fraction. So this fraction is then directly used by the scheduler to schedule the request for interest packets over the available paths. So let's look at an, a more detailed example. So we assume that we have two paths, P1 and P2. Um, we estimate the CQT ratio on part one as uh, 0.01. And we estimate the CQT ratio on path two as 0.18. So then we estimate the path utilization as one minus these and end up with 0.99 utilization on path one and 0.82 on, on P2. The path capacities then become, um, well, we, we also assume then that, that we monitor the flow rates on the paths at 99 megabits per second and 41 megabits per second, respectively. And then we divide by the estimated path utilization and we get 150 megabits per second, respectively. And the total path capacity then is 150 megabits per second. Uh, and the path fractions then become 100 over 150, uh, that is two thirds on path one, and 50 over 150, that is one third on path two. So then the scheduler simply distributes the traffic according to these uh, fractions over these two paths. So um, we use simulation to evaluate uh, our multi-path schedulers. Uh, it's an ICN simulator implemented in Omnet++. It is CCN NDN like with one request or interest per data packet. Uh, requests are routed, data follow the reverse path. We make use of CODL uh, control delay queuing with ECN marking. Uh, we have implemented a bulk client with TCP like congestion control. Uh, it uses slow start with an initial window of 10. Uh, we only have timer-based retransmission. Um, when an ECN mark is received, uh, we reduce the window with one quarter, um, but with a, at a loss, we reduce with uh, one half. We also have a transaction client with a configurable, configurable request rate. It can be fixed or according to a distribution. And caching is, is turned off. Uh, so in the paper, we compare our results directly with results in the PCON paper by Schneider at the ICN conference in, in 2016. Uh, we do that by replicating their scenarios for our schedulers, uh, but, but we do not repeat their uh, uh, experiments. Uh, but now I'm not going to present any of that those results. Um, since I have limited time here in the presentation, I'm going to cover um, basically only one scenario for the two schedulers. Uh, we call this the multi-path latency scenario. So the purpose with this is to show how our schedulers handle uh, the latency sensitive applications, which uh, first then the CQT scheduler does not optimize for. Um, so we have one shared path with lowest base latency. So that's the, the path here between router two and uh, a source two. It has a one-way delay of two milliseconds. Uh, then each client also has a private path uh, that has five millisecond one-way delay. Uh, client C1 
um, is a transaction client that would want low delay. And uh, uh, client C2 uh, is a bulk client that would like to have maximum throughput. And the C2 client is made more aggressive than normal. Uh, the purpose with this is to create uh, some queuing. Um, because we, as I mentioned, we have caudal queuing and that uh, keeps the queues too low for this experiment. Uh, so we made the client slightly more aggressive to create queuing and additional lay, delay on the shared path. So client one is active during the whole simulation. The client two uh, is active only in the middle one third. So the CQT scheduler starts in Unipath but switches to multipath at 90% path utilization. And it never switches back. It doesn't have that function. Uh, so let's look at some results. Um, at the, all of the graphs have the simulation time from zero to 60 seconds uh, on the x-axis. Uh, on the top left here, we see the transfer rates as experienced by the clients. So client one, the transaction client, has a fairly constant uh, uh, and low uh, rate. Uh, client two, we see starts at 20 seconds and achieves uh, its maximum 20 megabits per second. Each of the available two paths have 10 megabits per second. So it, it makes full use of the two available paths. We can see here at the bottom left graph uh, that plots the round trip time of both clients. And the red curve is client one. We see that it has a low and steady uh, round trip time until client two starts. Uh, we have quite some disturbance uh, in the beginning. Um, here also multipath is switched on for both of the clients since client two drives the utilization above 90%. Uh, we see that um, um, the round trip time for client one uh, is varying um, uh, it has uh, quite a lot of jitter and this is due to that this is average over the two available paths. So, so client uh, one's traffic is uh, using both of the paths. So it gets a lot of interference then from client two. Then when client two stops, uh, it goes back to uh, quite steady round trip time, but you hopefully see here that it is slightly higher than when we started. So this is due to that it still has multipath turned on and use both paths. Um, so this is in, in sort of an average of, of the delay of both of the paths. So we want to handle, as we wanted to handle transaction clients better than this, uh, we added RTT-based scheduling and uh, uh, to, to uh, um, design the R CQT RTT scheduler. Um, we concluded with other experiments, I should also say that uh, the CQT scheduler handles bulk clients well, uh, but we want to handle transaction clients better. Uh, so then we added this RTT-based unipath scheduling, uh, creating the CQT RTT scheduler. So the multipath scheduling is just like CQT, but the unipath scheduling uh, uses the path with the currently lowest RTT. So to get uh, RTT statistics from all the parts, we now and then duplicate packets on all parts. Um, the RTT metric is smoothed like in TCP with an exponential weighted moving average with alpha 1.8. And we have a state management algorithm that uses a uh, heuristics uh, that we call flow share of capacity uh, to decide whether a flow is transaction oriented or not. So the details are in the paper. Now we can see here for the CQT RTT scheduler, let's just look at the low, uh, lower left graph on the round trip time. We see that client one starts out with a low RTT. Uh, then when it gets interfered by client two, it switches over uh, on the other path, and its private path, and gets a slightly higher but very stable round trip time. And then when uh, somewhat after client two stops, it switches back uh, to, his, its, to the shared path with the lowest uh, RTT. So um, this experiment shows that uh, the algorithm uh, works as we uh, wanted. 
Then finally, uh, conclusions. So we presented the zero queuing time ratio metric, the CQT uh, metric, and it's used for estimating part utilization. Uh, based on this, we designed the CQT multipart scheduler and demonstrated its feasibility for bulk clients. Um, since the, we were not satisfied with the performance for um, transaction-oriented clients, we added the RTT Unipart scheduling uh, uh, and the, ended up with the CQT RTT scheduler. Uh, and we demonstrated this feasibility for both bulk clients and transaction clients. Um, we also compared our schedulers with the PCON work, the practical congestion control presented by Schneider et al. at the ICN conference in 2016. And we concluded that our schedulers are on par or slightly better than PCON for bulk flows. Thank you for listening. I mean, the consumers are business. Therefore, how do you actually indicate uh, which consumer wants the slow, I mean, the low delay and so on of high throughput? Is that indicated in the interest? How, how is that information conveyed to the forwarders? The sound is not very good. Can you repeat the question, please? Uh, the question is, how do consumers convey their performance requests to the forwarders? For example, C1 wants low latency and C2 wants high throughput. Well, they don't. There is no such uh, conveying of uh, their uh, need for performance. Uh, the, Okay, I thought that the whole thing is to um, offer multi-pass uh, that uh, gave the low latency consumer the desired performance and the high throughput consumer the desired performance. Yes, but th there is a heuristic uh, in the um, uh, forwarder that uh, um, decides whether a flow is a transaction oriented or, or bulk. Um, Okay. So that decides whether multi-part is turned on or not for that particular flow. So therefore, it's a forwarder who makes the decision. I see. Yes. The second. So part... you can you you can of course of course anticipate that the client uh, makes that selection. Um, that would be a pretty straightforward uh, addition to the algorithm. But we assume that that that's not generally uh, uh, done. Um. We still have one minute, so let me ask another question. I noticed that uh, in your simulation evaluation, the cache caching is turned off. What would happen with the designed uh, scheme when caching is turned off? Well, hopefully the clients will, in, will, will um, uh, have a higher performance. Um, since our interest was just to, to uh, um, evaluate the, the multi-part uh, scheduler, um, we decided to turn it off. Um, otherwise, there will be other kinds of interaction um, that was not uh, due to the multi-part scheduler. Okay. Uh, anyone else? Uh, thank you very much uh, for the good, great presentation. So now Thank we can... You. Uh, we can now move to the, the second paper presentation of the session. This one is done by uh, Su Chen Song, uh, who was a master's student at UCLA. And during his master's study, he uh, investigated into the ICN congestion control um, which he's going to present here, as well as 
uh, DDoS mitigation solutions. So he has graduated and now works at the VMware. I think that due to his uh, work constraints, he asked me to uh, help him uh, handle questions in the website. So uh, please start in the presentation. Hi, I'm Su Chen from UCLA. Today I'm going to talk about our work of effective Indian congestion control based on QSAT feedback. The network congestion control is a well-studied research area. A TCP slow start was developed in late 80s and successfully mitigated a network meltdown. A TCP and the Quick also have many recent solutions in the past few decades. All solutions follow the same basic system model. There's a end-to-end single-pass connection and sender collects feedback signal either implicitly using congestion loss or queuing delay or explicitly using ECM marks and the sender adjusts according to its uh, locally measured congestion level. In NDN, congestion control is a new research area. That's because NDN supports three new features that improve network throughput. That includes in-network caching, data multicast, and multi-pass forwarding. The system model that existing solutions are based on no longer applies because NDN don't have an end-to-end single-pass flow concept and sender consequently can no longer reliably infer the level of congestion. We show some evidence of the second claim uh, using some simulation study. So first, let's consider the case of multi-pass forwarding. Here, uh, we have a single consumer requesting data at a fixed speed and a single forwarder that make multi-pass forwarding decisions to pass with different round trip times. And the forwarder changes the traffic splitting ratio according to a sine wave. Uh, this sine wave is just chosen arbitrarily to emulate that there will be changes uh, representing multi-pass forwarding dynamics. And uh, the result of what the consumer will measure is shown in the left. You can see that for round trip time samples, it basically sees the uh, interleaving round trip time of each path uh, as expected. And if we look at the if we average those round trip time samples, the results basically represent uh, uh, how the traffic is split across the two paths. And looking at the consumer measured throughput, you could also find that when the forwarder is moving more traffic to the longer round trip time path, the throughput consumer measures decreases. And uh, let's look at the four second time point. At this time, the consumer sees a increasing round trip time and also a throughput that is below its sending rate. If the consumer adapts the TCP IP's way to interpret this, this, this measurements, it will conclude that there is a congestion. Uh, the, in the scenario with caching, uh, the result is similar. Let's consider the case where there are two consumers fetching a segment of a large object in order. And the uh, consumer one is started early but fetched at a lower speed. Consumer two started later and uh, uh, fetch at a higher speed. We ha they, since they have a shared cache and uh, they share the bottleneck, it is expected that consumer two uh, can use the cache to be able to catch up and eventually uh, fetch directly from the producer. And uh, let's look at during this process what the consumer two will measure. Initially, uh, it is being satisfied by the cache. It sees the round trip time to the cache and have a steady throughput matching its sending rate. Eventually, it's being satisfied by the producer and it also uh, has round trip time to the producer and a steady throughput matching sending rate. However, in between, the throughput decrease and the round trip time increases gradually. And that is because of the effect of interest, interest aggregation. When consumer one sends some interest to the producer, it leaves a pending interest in the forwarder. And uh, before this, uh, the data for this interest return to forwarder, consumer two's interest reaches this forwarder and gets aggregated. Later, when producer returns the data requested initially by consumer one, the data get multicasted to both of the consumers. Because of interest aggregation, consumer two will see a round trip time that is uh, higher than the round trip time to the cache, but lower than the round trip time to the producer. And this round trip time is mainly uh, depending on the progress difference between the consumers. And uh, that's why it increases gradually. Also, since consumer two during this process uh, is essentially relying on data requested by consumer one getting multicasted, 
So it also briefly sees the throughput of consumer one. And uh, if we adapt the same uh, interpretation of TCP IP to look at this uh, middle stage, uh, we could also conclude there is a congestion, which is not uh, exactly what happened. And based on those two experiments, we find the issue that end consumer, it's hard for end consumer in NDN to detect congestion reliably using their local measurements. And we hope to address this issue in this uh, work. And uh, what we, uh, there are two potential solutions. Uh, some existing works apply the point-to-point -point model to the ICN network by identifying individual forwarding paths. Then those, uh, the, then the existing end-to-end -end congestion control can be applied. For this work, we hope to investigate a effective congestion control without the reliance on end-to-end -end, uh, connection. And the key question for us is that where and how to set up the feedback loop for congestion control. And uh, we use the idea to establish a feedback loop between neighboring forwarders. So we developed this congestion control algorithm that is hop by hop, and it uses Q size as a reliable congestion feedback to previous hops. Uh, to control, control congestion, the action will be taken is to rate limit on interest transmission, and uh, any excess uh, incoming interest will be buffered at, at each forwarder. And to calculate this rate limit, we also use the idea to explicitly uh, measure the available bandwidth of each upstream. And uh, so we can rate limit below that value to be able to drain out the queue. As each forwarder runs this complicated al algorithm, the consumer only need to avoid overwhelming its first half forwarders and don't need to be very smart. With these basic ideas, next I'll introduce the details. Let's start with considering only network caching and the data multicast case. And then I'll show how the design can be uh, simply adapted to multipass forwarding cases with little modification, while also bring the benefit to make multipass forwarding decisions based on net network load. Our congestion control uh, algorithm design is based on the existing NDN forwarding pipeline. As mentioned, we added the idea to buffer incoming interest from the interest queue. We also added a feedback module that could uh, piggyback local queue size information on data packets to previous hops. And uh, for each forwarder, when it receives uh, upstream feedback, it will be able to process those feedback and update a local measurement table. This me measurement table is later used to calculate real limit, which controls interest transmission and, and also uh, result in uh, effective congestion control. Uh, let's start with uh, how the feedback is uh, decided. The feedback mar marked on each data packet is based on a simple rule. That is, the feedback should be the longest queue this data packet or its corresponding interest packet traverses. For example, if a interest packet goes through the upstream and the upstream later returns the data packets, the feedback on this data packet should be the maximum queue size between data queue and the interest queue. Otherwise, if the interest is aggregated, uh, the interest never get into the interest queue, so the feedback is only the data queue size. And uh, with the feedback, uh, we use a simple observation to explicitly measure the upstream bandwidth. The observation is that when upstream already have a large queue built up, uh, the current data arrival rate is a good estimation of its capacity. Because if you send faster than the current data arrival rate, that only results in a longer queue. And other than this rule, we also hope to reduce underestimation of bandwidth. So we have a rule to say that if data is returning even faster than the estimated bandwidth, we would also update the bandwidth estimation. Uh, based on those uh, measured band upstream uh, capacity and also queuing feedback, we could start to build the rate limits to control congestion. There are two parts of the rate limit. The congestion, uh, this rate limit calculation is done in a round by round basis. And for each round, we check if the current upstream queue size is above a threshold. And uh, if when that's the case, uh, we hope to avoid congestion by give up a portion of the its available bandwidth. And otherwise, we could send as fast as its available bandwidth. However, if the upstream have very small queue size, it could be underutilized. To avoid this situation, we would relax the, um, the rate limit on this upstream to be able to increase the network throughput. And the first part is called, uh, called congestion control. 
and the second part is called read probing. With this basic idea, we can extend the congestion control to in the multi-pass forwarding cases. And uh, the basic idea is still the same. We just apply the bandwidth estimation and the congestion control rate limits individually to each of the different forwarding paths. And uh, then uh, this also naturally brings a benefit that we could split uh, traffic to different upstreams based on the upstream load. Because when one upstream is congested, it gets less, uh, it gets a reduced Read limit, and we set, we split less traffic to that upstream. So the multipass forwarding is adaptive to network load, and uh, this uh, in the multipass forwarding case, we still have several minor changes to the algorithm. Uh, firstly, uh, when doing the probing, we only probe one upstream at a time. That's because when one upstream can already satisfy the needs, there's no point to make changes to other upstream. And secondly, we introduce a new rule called uh, avoiding unnecessary contentions, which helps to maximize uh, network multipass forwarding throughput in the some edge cases. I'll talk about it in the next few slides. The idea of avoiding unnecessary contention is essentially uh, to run the fault focusing algorithms backward edges uh, to maximize the network flow. And uh, I use this simple uh, topology in the right as an illustration. Here, all the solid uh, arrows have the same capacity. And we want to maximize the throughput by making multipath forwarding decisions at node one and uh, node two. And uh, as humans, we know that the best thing we can do is to use the top pass button pass as well as the middle pass and don't send anything uh, anywhere else. However, the issue is that uh, if the system is initialized like this, where the node two is incorrectly sending traffic to node three, blocking node one from utilizing the top path, uh, how can we uh, introduce some force to avoid node two from doing that? And uh, we use a simple observation to avoid this situation. The observation is that in this case, what essentially happened is that uh, node one cannot, uh, the node one, node two pass is limiting node two's uh, performance, but it's still, node two is still sending to node three, which have contention instead of node five, which don't have any contention. So from node two's perspective, it can, in this case, just give up uh, sending to those uh, passes with contention and move those traffic to a pass without contention. And that could move the system to a higher throughput. That's uh, basically the rule we introduce to avoid this situation. And with that rule, node two will eventually decide to send everything to node five and the network throughput could be maximized. With those uh, design details, we can talk about the evaluation of our design. Uh, uh, first, we simulated uh, in a caching scenario where there are three consumers fetching segments of a large object in sequential order, and uh, all of the uh, consumers have shared caches. They started at different time, but if they can effectively utilize their cache, ideally they could eventually be able to catch up with each other and uh, fully utilize the system's caching and uh, multicast. The simulation result is in the left. Uh, in the steady state, queuing delay is uh, stably under control, which shows that congestion is controlled. And if we look at the multi uh, the caching performance, we could find that each consumer, uh, the after the first consumer started, it would be able to put data into the cache. And the late started consumer will be able to utilize the cache to achieve the, a higher throughput and later be able to catch up with the early starters. And then uh, they could together utilize data multicast uh, to uh, fully utilize the bottleneck link of 60 megabits per second. And uh, the yellow consumer started later also follows this. It started by being satisfied by cache and later could uh, fully utilize the data multicast. And eventually everyone can get 60 megabits per second speed, which is like the bottleneck speed. So uh, the, the optimal uh, multicast is achieved. And uh, next, let's talk about the multipass forwarding scenario. Here we have uh, two forwarders need to make multipass forwarding decisions to different paths with a different round trip time and bandwidth. And uh, the result is shown in the left. 
here we still have that uh, each upstream uh, queuing delay is under control and is below the network run trip time, which shows congestion control is effective. And also we could look at look at uh, at how the traffic gets split. It. The uh, this figure shows how far the two split is traffic. We can see that uh, the replica three gets 70 megabits per second, and the replica two gets 30, which matches the uh, uh, available bandwidth of those links. And that also shows that the system can help to achieve a very high multipass throughput by being adaptive to the upstream throughput while controlling congestion. If we combine uh, caching and multipass forwarding, uh, the result is similar. As for multicast forwarding, uh, we have uh, two links with six, seven, uh, 30 megabits per second speed. And the, in steady state, the forwarder split uh, according to the upstream bandwidth. And uh, looking at the uh, caching effect, uh, both consumers will eventually be able to catch up and fully utilize uh, the data multicast or interest aggregation. So eventually, they could both achieve the optimal uh, maximum throughput. And uh, the queuing delay is also under control, showing that uh, combining caching and multipass forwarding, this design still uh, works as expected. Lastly, I'll talk about a few uh, takeaways of this work. Uh, we find that uh, NDNN consumers cannot reliably detect congestion using their local measurements. To address this issue, we design a new, we do a new design that uh, with the target of do not differentiate end-to-end -end flows and adapt existing end-to-end -end solutions. And we achieve this goal with half-by-half -half congestion control. Our design does have a scalability challenge because it requires the measurement table to need memory linear to number of namespaces. And uh, lastly, uh, we didn't dive deep into the fairness. However, we believe that uh, fair queuing can be used uh, together with Indian QSF to achieve a per namespace or per consumer fairness. Uh, we have some uh, simple uh, simulations to uh, validate this claim. Uh, you can refer to our paper for more details. And uh, lastly, uh, this work still has some remaining issues need to work in the future. Firstly, we hope to work on simulation study in some more complicated network environments. And also we hope to compare our design with some existing solutions. We also hope to better investigate the selection criteria of different parameters and analyze the stability of the system and its relation to various parameters. Uh, of course, as mentioned, we also hope to improve its uh, scalability. And uh, lastly, uh, we hope to look into uh, how to define fairness in NDN uh, without end-to-end -end uh, flow concept. And uh, with a new uh, with a definition, we could then uh, use fair queuing, try to achieve this fairness together with uh, Indian QSF's congestion control design. And uh, that's all for my uh, presentation today. Thanks a lot for listening. Okay, so uh, you heard another approach uh, to how to manage the multi-pass forwarding together with uh, caching. Any uh, questions from our audience? I don't know if anyone in the Slack has any questions. I have a question about the model. So, anyway, so each mechanism is feasible, very good. Each mechanism is very good, but so how uh, how to model the performance of the uh, networks? I mean, so uh, each part is okay, but we don't know the whole condition of the network is okay or not. Maybe so we need some performance model of the uh, your algorithm. So do you plan to develop some formal or models of the performance? Uh, so the question is about a formal modeling of uh, yes. the whole congestion control. I do not think we have started that, but I think that's a very big direction to look into. Uh, essentially, this is half by half uh, pushback. So therefore, in this multi-half, especially multi-pass split uh, scenario, I think it's a pretty complex scenario. So we have to look into that. But uh, the fundamental thing is that 
we say that ICN enables imagination. So therefore, the congestion control needs to take into account how we can control the congestion in the presence of the metal person. Our team is currently focusing on the congestion control and the caching, but very difficult. So maybe so we, we uh, model the interaction with the uh, maxima, uh, integer maximum problem, but uh, the result is very different from this simulation, so it's very tough. So that's why I asked you a question. Thank you. Uh, any other questions from the audience? Okay. Um, without any further questions, and there is nothing on the slide, I suppose. Um, okay, so in that case, let's proceed to uh, the third presentation. This one is by uh, Mohammed, who is a PhD candidates in the Stony Brook University. His uh, current research in, uh, focuses are on the designing novel wireless uh, media access control protocols for the new uh, wireless network protocol stack. So let's get to the presentation starts. Hi everyone, this is Mohammed al Badri. I'll be introducing OpCell, Optimal Producer Selection under Data Redundancy and Wireless Edge. This work is done in collaboration with Fawn Yee and Peter Miller, Stony Brook University. So the introduction to work is essentially um, based on the assumption that data redundancy is common in uh, many emerging wireless edge environments. For example, augmented reality or virtual reality content cached at multiple edge nodes need to be transmitted to multiple consumers concurrently. And these are usually distributed single hop or can be distributed single hop, and that creates a redundancy problem, uh, which is a producer selection problem. Existing work only address multiple hop redundancy and producer selection. So we introduce OpCell, the single hop optimal producer selection, and a real test that showed that OpCell is 3% away from ideal loss rate and improves latency over naive methods by two to three times as in multiple folds. So our motivation is a simple, let's assume a standard house floor plan. There is a first floor on the top right and then there is a second floor on the top bottom. Usually you have a producer or let's say an access point or router. You usually place it in the first floor. And then after that, you look at the normal data rate, which is the data rate possible or supported at each environment. And the nominal data rate per location based on one producer would basically be something around, if you're using Wi-Fi, it's 11 AC or so, probably around there. If that's only nominal data rate, that's not the good put um, to emphasize. So we'll have 600 MPPS, 450, 500 MPPS at the first floor. Second floor, because it's not line of sight, there is brick and other construction material and distance. You're probably getting 300, 100 MPPS, 65 MPPS at the further right, and 150 and a little bit closer. So now, this might not support, this will not be enough to support the actual uh, applications, specifically AR and VR, that need higher good put, since the normal data rate will be much lower in a real environment. So what could be done is deploying more um, edge producers or access points in these places that are overlapping in, um, in terms of coverage that they're all single hop, and that can increase the nominal data rate to be 600, 500, 600, 500 MPPS. Now, the problem that arises from this is if you have a consumer sending an interest, how do you select which one to send? So the current NDN methodology is play a random timer. If someone else is heard transmitting data for interest, do not transmit, which does make sense in multi-hop, but how does it work in a single hop? We're about to see. And the other question would be, how much should we wait for each interest packet before you before the producer starts sending it? So we try two different approaches. One is short timer latency, short timer window, just a random variation from zero to two milliseconds. And what we can see is that the ideal Basically, ideal is selecting the oracle or is an oracle knowing the right answer before starting any sampling. And we're only sending 20 data frames as a response to the interest packet. So as we can see, the ideal is usually below five milliseconds. When you have two producers 
it goes up already significantly, almost double, three triples and fours almost quadrupled. And that's because uh, multiple producers are transmitting. So you end up with low loss rates, but you end up with multiple falls of latency, two to three X of latency, just because of the medium loops. There's a lot of frames that are being transmitted in multiple throws. Now, what if we try a different approach, which is a long timer approach? Um, we end up with most of the time single producer transmitting, but the issue is that, um, and of course there's an increase in latency because now instead of one frame, instead of the whole pack being five millisecond, you're waiting up to five milliseconds so that you get a 1.5 to two X latency. And the other problem is high of varying loss rate. So loss rate can vary from 20% to 80% because you could, so if you're on the second floor and select the producer in the first floor, you end up with really lossy network just because it's not the ideal or optimal producer for you. So, brief background before we jump into details, network layer functionality is essentially multi-hop routing and filtering, and to end reliability, for example, TCP provides 100% reliability, and then it's agnostic to the physical layer and the medium. So what that means is that TCP, for example, NFT shouldn't care if it's running on 802.11 Wi-Fi, BGN, AC, 5 gigahertz or 2.4, or even Ethernet it should work go. Um, MAC layer functionality, on the other hand, is single hop filtering. It does not care about multi-hop, and it does not do any routing. It's only robust communication, so what that means is that it's usually best effort. 10 to 15% loss rate is acceptable. The network layer can compensate for the rest. And it's very dependent on the physical layer and the medium. So when you're designing a physical, when you're designing MAC layer for 811 AC, you need to work for MAC layer for 811 AC based on the physical layer. You can't just take a Mac layer from a different physical layer and put them together. It's not going to work well. It's very dependent on the medium as well. So the current NDN network, the current name, the, the networking status is the following. There is a network forwarding daemon, NFT, developed for internet. It's name-based multi-hop routing and filtering. It's a mature network layer. It's up to latest I checked 14, version 22.02. .02. References on the bottom of the paper, the developer guide, and the GitHub link. Um, for Mac layers, there's only one Mac layer right now, which is VMAC for wireless communication. It's name based single hop filtering and it has robust multicast, best effort, and three versions are released. Links, um, the reference for the paper and the GitHub link as well are on the bottom. Now, the goals and challenges for producer selection single hop are the following. So, the goal, first goal is optimal single producer, single hop producer selection protocol with minimal overhead. Selecting per interest, the challenge is that selecting per interest can cause high overhead. If you select and sample every single time a consumer sends an interest, you will have a lot of overhead. The other goal is given the wireless properties, for example, link asymmetry between producer and consumer. Consumers need to be the ones selecting which producers send their data because the consumers are the ones that are aware of how the network is performing on their end. The current NDN paradigm does not have an identity parameter that enables consumer to identify producers, not to filter. This is only to just identify which producer is which, so we can actually say, I want this data from this producer, not the other one. Um, the last goal is select the optimal producer for one or multiple consumers without coordination messages. So we want for AR and VR specifically for streaming data. Um, you will not have enough good put to send the same data three, three times. You want to send it once and all producer, all consumers get the data. But the challenge without explicit coordination messages is that um, the challenge of using them is that the coordination messages can get lost, cause delays among consumers, increase medium utilization, and collide among each other. With that in mind, we produce OPSO, the single hop optimal producer selection. So it consists of three components. The first component is a stream table. A stream table is used to connect pipeline interests that are application granularity. The second one is producer identification that enables nodes with data to announce what streams you can provide. And the third one is performance table and backup algorithm, which enables uh, the consumer leverages performance table and backup algorithm to pick optimal producer for the streams you want data from. We'll go into detail each of them just right now. So concept of a stream, what a stream is, is essentially the upper level of a data. It's a unique data name on an application level. So usually you have a file, let's say a video file, or let's say a VR, some kind of data compressed in a file, and you're about to send it. Usually the way it works is that NFT will take that file and you'll give it unique data names for each network packet of a specific size. And then the Mac layer will fragment it even further if necessary 
into Mac frames. Now, the stream name is the unique file name or video application name that is um, unique temporally and um, unique temporally and spatially. So what the stream enables us to do is that the Mac leader knows a series of entries. So now we know that V1, V2, V3, V4, V5 packets are all have the same common neighboring producer set. Basically the same set of producers that have the data across the nodes. So the system consumers can figure out who the ideal producer is in the first interest. So we can use V1 to sample multiple producers and then the rest of the request V2, V3, V4, V5 can go to the chosen optimal producer right away. The other part is applications registering in Mac layer identification key form, identification key code. So essentially applications register that the streams you can provide data for by providing a unique stream name. Each stream encoding is eight bytes, so we basically hash the unique name, the string that can be of um, large sizes into eight bytes that is spatially one hop and temporally throughout the duration of existing of that stream existing unique. And it has only to be unique one hop. And then each node announces periodically the streams it can provide data for. So each node announces what streams it supports as a producer periodically. And each beacon frame contains a list of all the streams the upper layers have registered. So all the applications that can be producers, they register the streams it can provide for, and then from there take it. Um, the selection protocol consists of three components, performance table, or the round robin sampling. And finally, it's back off algorithm which handles when the consumers are interested in the same data at the same time. Usually that's not the case. Usually you have consumers joining an ongoing stream or starting a, a stream after one is already complete. The likelihood of consumers all requesting the same data at the same time is very low, but we also accounted for it. So now um, to go in performance table, a performance table is essentially just a table we use to store performance requirements for a stream that the application is interested in. The table cares about storing threshold um, values for each stream, which are for loss rate and latency, which essentially helps us measure the good put. And a producer that meets such requirements is considered a qualifying producer, meaning a producer that meets application needs and can be selected. There could be multiple qualifying producer in any environment. We'll talk about how we select the ideal one from there. Um, but before we do so, um, we will go over order round robin sampling. And basically that's when consumers are joining on ongoing transmission or after. So in, this is a scenario we'll go over slowly. For example, let's imagine the first, um, we have three producers and two consumers. C1 is the first consumer. It has um, pipeline interest from one through six. And it knows through identification beacon that three uh, producers have the data. So what consumer one is going to end up doing is sample each producer by sending one interest, a different interest, interest one to one, interest two to producer two, interest three to producer three, and see what the, how the data comes back, how many frames are lost, what's the latency, etc. After so, it finds out that producer three is the ideal producer, so it sends the rest of the request to producer three. Now that's how sampling works for one producer for one consumer. Now, if a consumer two wants to send other kind of, another kind of stream or um, different interest packets, but also they have the same producer set, one, two, three producers, um, what produce, consumer two will do right away is sample producer three right away first. If producer three meets the performance requirements, it will just send the rest of the interest to it. So instead of having to start all over again and sample each consumer, each producer, Consumer 2 already leveraged the performance and overhearing the data performance of Consumer 1 that it just selected Producer 3 right away. Now, the backoff algorithm is the case where if multiple, produce, multiple consumers did sampling and then they all have to converge into one or ideally as little as possible of producers. So let's say you have three consumers interested in the same data and there are five producers that can potentially provide the data. Now, there could be multiple qualifying producers for each consumer, but the likelihood of that optimal producer for all the consumers being the same is very low. However, optimal producer being a good producer as in a qualifying producer for all consumers is very possible. So what the goal is, the consumers converging on smallest set of producers after sampling to reduce medium waste. We don't want redundant transmission that is unnecessary. 
So what we process is each consumer samples each producer. And then when selecting, the more qualifying producers a consumer have, the longer it waits. So essentially, a consumer that has more producer options to select from, it waits a little bit longer. And then if it hears another consumer selecting a producer, the consumer checks on its own list if that producer selected for that stream is a qualifying producer or not. If it is, that producer is also selected. Otherwise, it waits and selects the best one for that consumer for itself. And then we go over the implementation. We have a real test bit that we implemented on Raspberry Pi 4s. We use alpha dongles, 8 to 11 and 2.4 gigahertz. We have a setup of four producers and three consumers. The nominal data rate selection goes from one MPPS to 65 MPPS. We'll show some of our evaluation results. We started evaluating the effectiveness of loss prediction. So essentially how accurate are initial frames in estimating risk of transmission. So essentially we said we used the first interest to us um, to basically ass assess how or estimate how the rest of the transmission is going to be. So we essentially did a setup where we have four producers with loss rate varying from 35 to 100 percent and 500 data frames every 10 seconds being sent by each producer for four days back to back. And then as you can see on the figure, we estimated the estimation errors based on the 500 data frames. We find out that at 20 frames, Regardless of the producer, our estimation is off by maximum of 15%. And as you go on higher frames, it just becomes a log, and it, it really doesn't matter. At zero and less, at, at five or so, it can go up to 20%. But once you go to 20 frames, it's near 12 to 14%, which is pretty low during these missing. And then we started looking at box plots and we can see as a number of frames, as you go to 20 frames out of 500 frames, they're pretty good that 95% of the time we're less than 5% off from the total real um, loss rate in terms of estimation. So that tells us that we can actually use the initial frames to sample how, many, uh, how much the loss rate is for the total data coming in from each producer. And then after that, we started evaluating based on sampling the producers, how our system performs based on sampling multiple, um, based on the multiple producers. So we tested first um, using a timer. This is a long time of performance, and this is based on 10 interest packets pipeline back to back. Each of them is 25 data frames, total of 250 data frames. Ideal is the Oracle, as in someone who knows which producer should be selected prior beforehand. We can see that we were able to reduce latency by two to three times from the timer approach just because now we're actually selecting the right producer right away and we're not waiting too long. We're just selecting it right away after we finish sampling, after we do the sampling process, which also doesn't waste the medium because it's sending data and getting data back. Also, at the same time, we notice that we are 3% away in terms of loss rate from the ideal, which is Oracle instead of the timer approach, which varies from 20% to 80%. And the reason we're 3% we're away from ideal loss rate is because our first initial frames loses more data because they're sampling uh, producers that are not ideal. But after that, it selects the correct producer and we get basically the best performance we can get out of the system. So we're essentially very close to ideal with such sampling procedure. And then we took it a step further by implementing OpCell with DAC. DAC is a VMAC multicast robustness protocol, which tries to do retransmission. It's a best ether protocol, and we were able to reduce the loss rate from 20% to less than 5%. Even while doing the retransmission, we are still obtained less um, latency than the long timer approach, which can go up to 100 milliseconds. We were at 60. 60 to 70 millisecond latency at the end as well, which is better than um, timer approach. Other experiments we performed and the results are in the paper. We analyzed the uh, on-demand, which is basic discovery based versus periodic discovery performance. Uh, we also, how often the optimal producer changes and we've tested how our system is able to adapt if the optimal producer changes over time. We've also done analysis and studies on how the consumer is not having one ideal producer, where if you have five, four consumers and two producers need to be selected to meet the performance requirements and how the system handles such cases. We've also done indoor results under various environments. Some environments were very lossy and some environments were completely quiet where the results were pretty, pretty good. 
We've also analyzed and considered RSSI. We uh, received signal strength indicator to analyze and see if we can use that data instead of sampling to select the optimal producer, and we have results that it's not reliable or a good indicator. Previous researchers have also shown similar results. Um, as part of discussion, does every data and pending interest table need to be registered in a stream? No, only data for the only for data that application developers know will be redundant single hop and needs upsell. Data that is known to not be redundant or need such optimization do not need upsell. The system requires overhead from the user because the user needs um, to register the stream and needs to also provide what kind of performance they would like to see from the interest from the stream when they're requesting it. But that also comes as a benefit of reducing improving loss rate from 80% to 20% and decreasing latency among multiple faults. Um, and again, for RSSI, we have done ex extensive evaluation on RSI and found out that it is independent from loss rates. And we have a lot more discussion in the paper for anyone interested. So in conclusion, this is single hop data redundancy in wireless edge environment. We cannot solve, be solved by random timer. Um, we designed upsell single hop optimal producer selection. Our real test that is able to reduce loss rate 5% instead of 20 to 80% with DAC protocol and retain lower latency 60 millisecond instead of 100 millisecond. Thank you for your time. And for any technical questions, please email us at the bottom email so for any questions. Thank you. Um, that's uh, that's also a uh, thank you, Mohammed, for the presentation. Although I wish we had more energy. <laughs> any questions for Mohammed? What is uh, a single hub? What is a producer selection? I, I can understand why he's low energy. I just saw on the Slack exchange, he was expecting to come here in person. And then the visa issues stopped him. Yeah, unfortunately. OK. Uh, so you can see us, I guess. Uh, apparently, there are no questions here. Because that's conclude um, with the first uh, presentation session. So now we're running late. Everything schedule, I guess I shouldn't go through it here. You can hear in the lunch. So, time for lunch. Thanks, everyone. Okay, so uh, uh, let me announce uh, regarding the uh, lunch break. So, we can have a uh, uh, lunch box at the second floor. And let me announce uh, uh, regarding the next poster session. Uh, it will be it will be started as scheduled at 1345. Okay. Thanks. Back to uh, each uh, poster presenter. So uh poster presenter please uh, display your own poster at the second floor. So you can easily find which boards to use. Thanks.